Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, the first faculty lecture of the semester. Um, Mark asked me to introduce him, and it's a great honor and privilege and pleasure, uh, as we have been close colleagues since he came uh, to Garrett Evangelical. Uh, we've often said that uh, you can't uh, be a church leader unless you are an evangelist, and I have no way how you can be an evangelist if you aren't a leader. So it's been a good, uh, a good relationship, and um, not to be too maudlin, I'll miss that uh, in the day today. But we have greater work to do in the larger vineyard. Um, officially, his title is the Reverend Doctor Doctor uh, Mark Teasdale. I'm told that his wife, Anna, calls him the Reverend Dr. Square, which has its own meaning in terms of his piety and other things. Uh, Mark is a native of the Washington, D.C. area, uh, and I think that if you read his work, it's very clear that he's been influenced by being that close to the nation's capital and what that means for uh, the life of the church. Um, he is the E. Stanley Jones associate professor. If you visit his office, he had to cross out Sistant, and we sim simply need to get him a new sign. Um, uh, when, we, when we put people on the margins of the third floor here or there, um, he needs a new sign. Uh, uh, he was magna cum laude at American University, a major in international studies, a minor in Japanese language and culture. Summa cum laude at Wesley for his Master of Divinity. You see he was going on to perfection even then. He got a D-min at Wesley uh, in stewardship and church leadership. Uh, and the title uh, evidences um, uh, Anna, to whom he is married, and his conversation with the World Church, developing a praxis of financial stewardship for the Serbian Orthodox Church in conversation with the church in North America. Um, meaning he reached out and touched, and that was very, very important. He got his PhD at Perkins under the advisorship of former President Ted Campbell. Um, Mark is the one at commencement who wears the red hat and the blue robe, and therefore his students affectionately call him Papa Smurf. The result of that work for which he did not have Latin words. I guess in Texas it's English only, uh, but he did get high honors for that work. Resulted in uh, what I consider a groundbreaking book called uh, Methodist Evangelism, American Salvation, which basically deals with the 19th and early 20th century development of the Methodist movement in the United States. Uh, oftentimes in that field of study, you get the sense when you're reading it was from the Acts of the Apostles write to John Wesley, write to your hometown or your favorite cause, with nothing that happened in between. And Mark has, has written a very distinctive book, drawing on his interests not only in evangelism and history, but missiology, and the way in which he binds those all together uh, adds to a vital witness in public theology. Mark is, if we know him, at heart a pastor by disposition, an administrator with a keen sense of organization and the discipline of a constant scholar. And if you go on rate my professor, he has a perfect five with a red chili pepper. Mark has led our doctor of ministry and revised it. And I am very proud to say that it not only is a great doctor of ministry, but has produced award-winning projects and each of the graduates are challenged and have made significant contributions to the church. And so although he is still going on to perfection in his own life, he challenges himself and he challenges us through his scholarly work. And I'm not going to read all of what he has produced in his sabbatical, uh, but there are four major works that are coming out. And his lecture today is evangelism and radicalization. And I can't wait to hear what Mark has to say about radicalization. So welcome, Dr. Dr. Mark Teasley. Well, let me begin by, by giving some thanks uh, at the beginning here. I want to thank the school, and especially Dean Rivera and President Rector, for my opportunity to have a sabbatical. And a long overdue thanks uh, to two of our faculty colleagues, uh, both Dr. Ron Anderson and Dr. Stephen Ray. Back when I was uh, just starting on board, I just finished my first year here, uh, and I was still ABD. 
And the two of them, as I understood it, conspired together to get me uh, not a sabbatical, but a teaching leave for one semester so that I could finish my dissertation. Uh, and if it weren't for them doing that way back then, I doubt I would have had a sabbatical to take just this past year. And so I am grateful to both of them and want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge a couple people in the audience. Um, one is there's Jack and there's Brian. Both of them are part of the 5 a.m. crowd that uh, work out at the, the McGaw YMCA down here. Brian in particular, who's been my workout buddy for the past six years and just got me to bench press 220 yesterday uh, through his coaching. So I'm really impressed with, uh, Brian's done some great things and he's a, he's a good friend. I'm glad to have him here. Today I want to, wanted to start by just bringing out some newspaper articles or some other ideas about what is involved with radicalization. Um, and I'd, I'd started working on this, actually playing with the idea of this lecture back in October, and I thought, well, I could just gather a few along the way. What I didn't realize is just how overwhelming the amount of material would be. And after a while, I gave up on my newspaper clippings that I was trying to maintain because there was so much coming out on every level, uh, national, international, local news even, that were talking about the issue of radicalization. And it was just too much to be able to try to, to bring it all together. Probably at some point, even just this short week so far, you've heard something, whether you listen to the BBC or NPR or whatever it might be, even in the Chicago Tribune, you'll find something about radicalization in there. And uh, what I want to do instead is start by looking at just a very brief history of the word and then going on from there. Since the early 2000s, the word radicalization began appearing with greater regularity in foreign policy and security circles. In the past three years, with the increase of high-profile terrorist attacks, it has made its way into common news media parlance. The murders in San Bernardino, Paris, and at the Boston Marathon are all explained as being the work of people who have been radicalized. To make sense of what radicalization means, I have found it useful to track the use of the word radical as it's been used in the United States over the past half century. Following World War II, the word radical was used primarily as a noun. People were radicals if they were committed to a cause that demanded a change in the status quo of the political, economic, or social structures in the United States. The term was used to describe a variety of groups in the 1960s who were demanding such things as racial equality and an end to the militarism of the United States in Vietnam. Following the tumult of the 60s, during what seemed like, at the time, to be a relatively settled period in American culture, the word radical shifted to become more of an adjective. It described those that held the most extreme versions of belief systems, making them out of step with the settled culture. It is perhaps best known in the United States today as a modifier for religious or political beliefs, for example, radical Islam or radical right-wing fundamentalists. The one thing that both these uses, usages of the word have in common is that they create a buffer between radicals and normal people. Those of us who listen to mainstream news outlets or who are relatively comfortable with the status quo, not saying we agree with everything, and who see no need to resist the structures around us, at least with violence, can speak of this other group as a third person. They are different from us. We do not need to identify with them in any way. This is what has made the arrival of the verb form so frightening. Radicalization argues that there is not a central difference between those who hold extreme views and those who are comfortable with the status quo. In fact, if we were to draw Venn diagram circles, the circles that have these two groups would overlap. The very people who are radicals, it turns out, and have radical beliefs started as those who were comfortable with the status quo once upon a time. Sociologists have done extensive work proving that the line of demarcation between the kind of people who remain normal and the kind that become radical simply does not exist. Peter Simi, who studied right-wing extremist groups in the United States for 17 years and who co-authored the book American Swastika, Inside the White Power Movement's Hidden Spaces of Hate, made this point in an interview he gave with the Southern Poverty and Law Center in February 2014. Asked about commonalities that those who join radical groups may have, Simi said, in general, there's really no single profile. There are doctors, lawyers, scientists, and other highly educated folks who are involved in these groups. 
I think this underscores that you do see a wide range of individuals involved in these groups, and it's really important that we change some of these common misconceptions about there being a specific kind of person joining them. Simi's argument is repeated in the literature concerning who joins radical groups overseas. The National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism at the University of Maryland, in surveying the more than 200 Americans who have traveled to join militant groups overseas, since 1980, states in a September 2015 briefing document that the truth about this danger is complicated and cuts across personal lives, ideological dispositions, geography, historical precedent, and changing extremist propaganda. To fully grasp the problem at hand, we must challenge conventional wisdoms and demand that even the casual inquiry take hard facts and good methodology into account. Examples of normal people, quote unquote, who have identified as radicals abound. Aksa Mahmood, a 19-year-old university student from Glasgow, Scotland, left an affluent household behind to become the bride of an ISIS fighter in Syria in 1920, uh, November 2013. Hoda Muthana, a quiet 20-year-old woman who attended school, high school in Hoover, Alabama, and then went to study business at the University of Alabama, suddenly left to join ISIS in November 2014. Closer to home, there have been two arrests at O'Hare. In October 2014, a 19-year-old Mohammed Hamza Khan from Bolingbrook, as he prepared to get on a flight, allegedly to join ISIS. And in April 2015, 34-year-old Joshua Van Haften from Wisconsin, who had allegedly just returned from traveling overseas to provide material support for ISIS members. And these are just a very few references that I'm using that have been in the news. If we were to broaden it beyond ISIS, which is what makes the news right now, there'd be many, many more, probably thousands more, that uh, would be in reference to people joining domestic terror groups or radical groups as well. The simple fact is that anyone and everyone is a potential radical. There is no armor of normalcy, whether in the form of race, socioeconomic class, family upbringing, or political inclinations that will forestall any of us, our children, or our grandchildren from becoming radicalized. The one thing that families of those who have been radicalized and authorities alike point to as a commonality in all of these cases is the power of the messages that those who became radicalized encountered. These messages slowly transform the people's thinking convincing them to abandon their previous beliefs in favor of new radical beliefs. And this is what caught my attention. In this regard, radicalization sounds not unlike evangelization. Evangelism has long been seen as the domain of extremists, or at least overly enthusiastic Christians. It is certainly not activity associated with normal people, as the Tony Award-winning musical Book of Mormon has made amply clear. For the average person, it conjures up images of conservative Bible thumpers, megaphones, or Twitter handles in hand, ready to demand people convert to their peculiar form of, Christ of the Christian faith. Along with, and along with these fire and brimstone preachers, there are the smooth charlatans who, while they may not be pious in their own lives, excel at manipulating those around them to invest their time, money, and energy into their causes. Visions of Sinclair Lewis's Elmer Gantry are all too real for many of us. Both the radicalizer and the evangelist are especially potent because they appeal to God as, their, as substantiating their claims. This is a critical point. They are not just propounding ideologies. They are sharing ideas that are undergirded by theologies. Curiously, secular policy has been reluctant to acknowledge this religious element. As Os Guinness puts it, policymakers seem to be tone deaf to people's beliefs about God. I personally experienced this last summer when I had the opportunity to speak about the issue of radicalization with people who uh, work in the humanitarian NGOs in Washington, DC. They ticked off poverty, disaffection with the government, and lack of opportunity as the reasons that people become radicalized. When I agreed, and let me emphasize, I agreed with them on these points, and suggested that religion was also a factor, they quickly dismissed me, suggesting that I was one of those narrow scholars who wants to force everything into a little box defined by religion. For them, even if someone acknowledged the sociological problems, but also pointed to the theological dimension, that person was narrow-minded and unrealistic in the analysis. 
I'm at least pleased not to be alone in my narrow-minded perspective that religion is critical in understanding radicalization. Other scholars have likewise pointed to the fact that religious convictions cannot be subsumed to sociological concerns. Both Mark Jurgensmeyer in Terror in the Mind of God, The Global Rise of Religious Violence, and Oliver McTurnan in Violence in God's Name have made this point ably. However, even in light of this prevailing deafness to the religious aspects of radicalization, there are hints that governments are beginning to make this connection. The UK, where sensitivity to the danger of radicalization is much higher than it is in the United States, is evidence of this. On October 19, 2015, the British government issued a report that re recommended the government should have the authority to close mosques to avoid their becoming disseminating points of radicalizing messages. In explaining this stance, Prime Minister David Cameron explicitly acknowledged the relationship between radicalization and theology. He stated, Islamist extremists don't just threaten our security, they jeopardize all that we've built together, our successful multiracial, multi-faith democracy. While Islamist extremists in no way represent the true spirit of Islam, we cannot ignore the fact that they attempt to justify their views and their actions through Islamic scripture and theology. While recognizing that theology is a critical component to radicalization is laudable for a head of state, it is also dangerous given the discomfort so many policymakers and government officials have about religion. The step that Cameron and his government recommend is an especially disturbing one, not least because it sets up a zero-sum game between any religious organization and the state. If the state finds that the church or any other religious organization is uh, saying something that is out of step with the government's prevailing definition of what a multiracial, multi-faith democracy is, that religious organization is in danger of being regarded as a threat and being closed forcibly. To break up a clear terrorist cell is one thing. To, to, to condemn houses of worship that might be related to such organizations is going too far. Even if houses of worship are left unmolested, is it too much to imagine that this sort of logic could lead to a clampdown on evangelism? After all, evangelism is a theologically motivated practice of inviting others to change their beliefs and their way of living. Knowing the strong prejudice that stands against evangelism already, especially in the way that it is conceived of in the, proper, in the popular imagination, I find the potential for such a prohibition to be unsettlingly likely. Lest you think I push this point too far, consider that starting this year, France is training grade school teachers in what amounts to apologetics for secularism to overcome religious ideas brought up in class that the teachers might consider to run counter to the French notions of liberty and fraternity. Also, let me share an experience I had just two months ago. As part of the executive committee for the Academy for Evangelism and Theological Education, I contacted a professor about being the Academy's keynote speaker this coming, coming June for our annual meeting. The speaker initially accepted, but later contacted me to rescind that acceptance. She explained that she felt speaking at an evangelism conference would put her professional review in danger at her school. She did this because she had seen she would be seen as advocating for the Christian faith instead of just teaching it as a religion. She based this on the fact that she had watched other faculty members downgraded in their reviews for having participated in similar conferences the previous year. These are just two examples. Based on this, I could foresee a great many people supporting the government in such a prohibitory action against evangelism as part of a move to clamp down on radicalization. This in spite of evangelism long having been seen as an essential right for people in a free society. The US Supreme Court has consistently supported seeing the practice of evangelism as a right, including in Hague v. CIO, 1939, in which the court declared evangelistic use of public spaces protected under the First Amendment, Martin v. Struthers, 1943, in which the court declared evangelistic door-to-door -door visitation to be protected under the First Amendment, and Murdoch v. Pennsylvania, also 1943, in which the court protected the right to pass out gospel tracts. The majority opinion of the Murdoch case sums up well the court's decisions in all three cases. 
This form of religious activity occupies the same high estate under the First Amendment as do worship in the churches and preaching from the pulpits. It has the same claim to protection as the more orthodox and conventional exercises of religion. It also has the same claim as the others to the guarantees of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. While the Supreme Court may view evangelism as unorthodox and unconventional, it nonetheless has bestowed upon evangelistic activity the position of being one of the inalienable rights citizens of the United States enjoy. Of course, if we are using rights language, we must acknowledge that the right of a religious adherent to propagate his or her faith must be balanced by the right of others to be left alone. I do not question this, nor should any Christian evangelist. Jesus himself invited all to repent in light of the coming kingdom, but left ample room for people to walk away from him too. A great many people took Jesus up on this offer, including the rich young ruler and those who were unwilling to sacrifice to become his disciples. The issue I raise here is not whether evangelists ought to have their message accepted in the public square, but whether evangelism should be allowed at all in this day of radicalization. The problem I pose in this lecture is the potential for infringing on the right of the evangelist to evangelize because the very practice of inviting people to change their faith could be seen as subversive to the state and distasteful to the citizens. To put my own cards on the table here, if we were to restrict the practice of evangelism in the name of national security, we would not be protecting freedom. Rather, we would be establishing an ideological regime that prescribes what people are allowed to believe and express. The irony in this should be clear. The very states seeking to protect their multiracial, multi-faith democracies would end up acting just like the radicals they condemn by forbidding conversion to anything that they find offensive. At the same time, those who desire to practice evangelism must be sensitive to the fears that beset the state today by being careful in how they exercise the rights that they have. Just as freedom of speech does not allow for us to yell fire in a crowded auditorium, so preserving freedom of evangelism should not be a cloak for supporting the work of hate mongers and promoters of violence. Evangelism is, as defined by its own name, good. Violence and hatred decidedly are not. So that I do not allow evil to mingle with the good that I want to defend in this lecture, I need to tease out the relationship between evangelism and radicalization. It's to this that we will devote the balance of our time. There are two areas I suggest that we must explore concerning evangelism vis-a-vis -vis radicalization. These are the content and the practices of each. In dealing with content, I want to focus specifically on the vision that the evangelist or the radicalizer has in the ultimate. I define the ultimate as what a person believes about God's purposes. Assuming continuity between who God is and what God does, this includes what a person believes about the character and activities of God. God's purposes flow from the nature of God and direct the actions of God. Evangelists and radicalizers alike believe that the purposes of the God they worship are wide enough to encompass all people. This is a critical point of agreement between the two. Both believe that their God and their God's purposes are big enough to be relevant, even necessary, for everyone to hear. There is no people or culture who remain a matter of indifference. This is why they undertake the persuasive work that they do. Both the evangelist and the radicalizer would agree that the purposes of their respective gods are to bring about something not unlike the transcendentals described by Plato to make people one under the common reign of their God, to make everything good in relation to their God's character, and to cause all people to believe what is true, as such as it is propounded by that God. More than this, both believe their God will ultimately bring these transcendentals to pass in time. Put another way, today both the evangelist and radicalizer must struggle to convince people to recognize the purposes of their gods, but one day, their struggle will end decisively as the gods they proclaim set all things right. The commonalities between evangelism and radicalization end at this juncture, though. This is because while each believes that their god's purposes are universe-spanning, they do not agree on whether all people will share in their god's favor when these purposes are finally enacted. 
The Christian evangelist believes that God wants to bring about the good for all people through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself is an example of this. While focusing on the Jews during his earthly ministry, he did not neglect sharing God's gracious power and message with Samaritans and Gentiles. After his resurrection, Jesus explicitly called on his followers to go out and to share with all people everywhere. All four Gospels and the book of Acts record him commissioning his apostles to go throughout the world to preach his message, inviting all to repent and to be baptized into the community of believers. Christian evangelists follow this command still today, believing that their message is good news for everyone without exclusion. The only people who will not partake in the goodness of God's kingdom are those that self-select out of it, not those that the evangelist decides shouldn't hear it. The radicalizer, however, is more particular. Radicalizers, as have been demonstrated through numerous studies of those who engage in violent extremism, have two different messages for two different audiences. The one audience is the in audience. This is an audience made up of people who already accept some of the basic premises the radicalizer holds. The radicalizer seeks to radicalize this audience. The idea is to move the person from being, in the eyes of the radicalizer, a less committed believer to a more committed one by convincing them to join the radicalizer in accomplishing their God's purpose. This is where the social media activity of ISIS in reaching out to Muslims around the world comes into play, for example. The out audience is a different matter. This audience is composed by those who, for whatever reason, are outside of the pale of the good purposes of the radicalizer's God. This audience does not need to be radicalized, but made to understand that they stand condemned by the radical radicalizer's God already. In this regard, most radicalizers exhibit what psychologists Charles Strozier and David Terman call a fundamentalist mindset. This is not to say they are participants in the historical form of fundamentalism, a term used to describe those who held to specific Christian beliefs over and against modernist readings of the Bible and questions of evolution. Rather, a fundamentalist mindset is marked by dualism and paranoia, allowing those who have such a mindset to dichotomize people into in-groups and out-groups, the former to be embraced, the latter to be feared. This dichotomization is linked to an eschatological theology that expects divine separation of the in and the out groups at the end of time, with punishment falling on those in the out group. Given that God will bring a violent end to the out group eventually, radicalizers believe they are justified in using violence against that feared out group in the here and now. As Jurgensmeyer explains, this violence is performative, sending a message of divine condemnation to those in the out group. Usually, radicalizers select targets among the outgroup that represent a way of life they believe is especially offensive to their God. For example, the underground in England or the World Trade Centers in the United States, both representing the opulence of the West. Military personnel in Fort Hood, Texas, representing the warmongering of the United States in the Middle East. Or the Coptic Christians in Egypt, representing those who would not be dissuaded from their faith. All of these are meant to send the message of the power of the radicalizer's God to destroy the feared way of life of the outgroup. Now, you may well point out at this point that there are people who identify as Christian evangelists who are every bit as dichotomizing and condemning as the radicalizers. Fair enough. That's true. In such a case, we need not besmirch the good name of evangelism with the radicalizing activities of those that claim the title of evangelist. Just as we would no more conclude that all pastries are to be disdained and untasted because a monkey decided to put on a chef's hat, so we would do well not to misjudge, misjudge evangelism because those who put on the hat of evangelist and yet fail to share God's goodness with all other people turn out to be radicalizers. This makes a good segue for us to move from the content of what evangelists and radicalizers believe to how they undertake the work of spreading those beliefs. Both evangelists and radicalizers could be said to engage in question-begging activities. They engage in activities that are different enough from those of most people that people will ask them, why do you do this? The means by which they evoke these questions vary dramatically, from, raiding, from quietly working for the good of the poor and the marginalized to disrupting funerals with hate-filled banners. Regardless of the activities they use, 
Evangelists and radicalizers have the common goal of wanting people to know more about what they believe. Their activities are invitations to learn more about their respective faiths. This practice of invitation is necessarily conditioned by context. Without being contextually meaningful, the invitation of the evangelist or radicalizer would fall on uncomprehending ears and be rendered ineffective. Both the evangelist and the radicalizer would be reduced to stereotypes of themselves, not credible agents of their gods with messages for consideration by the larger world. However, contextualization is also a point of differentiation between the evangelist and the radicalizer. Once again, this is because of the dichotomizing nature of the radicalizer's message in contrast to the universal invitation of the evangelist. For the Christian evangelist, the contextual move goes hand in hand with the universality of the gospel message. These two seemingly exclusive pieces are held together by the doctrine of the incarnation. Just as the eternal Logos became incarnate in a particular time and place, such that Jesus of Nazareth was born both fully God and fully a contextually conditioned human, so the evangelist can offer an invitation to participation in God's universal grace while making that message contextually meaningful in whatever time and place the evangelist operates. In being contextually meaningful, the Christian evangelist is not obliged to accept all things that a culture contains as being in accord with the good news of God. The evangelist can and must judge culture in light of the good news. Here is the key issue, though. In doing this, the evangelist is not called to condemn the culture, but to redeem it. The evangelist breathes God's grace into the culture by offering creative new practices and artifacts to displace or redefine what is sinful. Consider, for example, how Sam Hain became Halloween, when the ancient missionaries taught the Celts how to reinterpret their belief in evil spirits in the light of the sanctifying grace of Jesus Christ. Even if the people reject the message of the evangelist, the evangelist is still called to work to generate a better culture for those who live in that culture. As our own Dr. Papandrea has explained in his text, Seven Revolutions, the early church did this, advocating for the dignity of all people and laying the groundwork for our current notion of human rights. This is one of the reasons that Pope Francis has insisted, as shown in the title of his first major encyclical, on talking about the joy of the gospel. The work of evangelism is joyful because it offers a better life to everyone, whether they accept the message or not. The evangelist invites all people to know the grace of God who allows rain, sun, and crops for the just and the unjust alike, and then gets to work securing those blessings for the people in the culture. Radicalizers also claim to have a universal message. It is a message of judgment only, though. All people stand under this judgment, some who will be upheld by it, and most who will be destroyed by it. There is no notion of redemption as with the Christian evangel. While this message does, not, does make a claim on all people, radicalizers cannot enact their message in a universal way. The irony of universal judgmentalism is that it forces the radicalizers to define themselves and their theologies by cultural categories. The reason for this is that radicalizers must have a clear picture of what it looks like to be good or evil in the sight of their God. This is only possible by translating their ideas about what their God demands into culturally and socially defined behaviors. Radicalizers can only say that someone is good or evil ultimately if they can determine if they are good or evil contextually, living in ways that honor or reject their God in the context that surrounds them. This is no incarnation in which the fullness of a universal God dwells together with the fullness of contextually shaped humanity. Rather, it is a reduction of what they claim to be eternal into finite terms. Instead of an eternal, an eternal identity imprinting itself on the mortal world, what is supposed to be eternal is minimized to reacting to the way the people in various contexts already define themselves. Radicalizers take cultural values, conventions, and artifacts as they are already existing and can only approve them or condemn them as being in, properly in league with their God's purposes or not. They have no capacity to be creative or to cultivate new culture. 
In doing this, radicalizers become partisans in the culture wars, reducing their god and their god's plans to accomplishing whatever cultural, social, political, or economic agendas they hold. Their cosmic hopes are whittled down to whether the right party gets elected, the proper set of laws are enacted, the revolution they are throwing is successful. They subsume their theology to sociology, taking on contextually defined identities and fighting against those of opposite identities. G.K. Chesterton explained this phenomenon well in his book, Orthodoxy. There is such a thing as a narrow universality. There is such a thing as a small and cramped eternity. You may see it in many modern religions. Now speaking quite externally and empirically, we can say that the strongest and most unmistakable mark of madness is this combination between logical completeness and spiritual contraction. The lunatic's theory explains a large number of things, but it does not explain them in a large way. The nation-building project of ISIS conforms to this idea. Even as they develop the infrastructure a nation needs, they are known for what they resist rather than what they build. Their own propaganda demonstrates that they see themselves in a pitched battle with the culture of the West, adopting forms of Islamism that are, con that are calculated to portray the most extreme rejection of Western values. Even its relationship with the peoples in the regions of Iraq and Syria, where it holds sway, are defined less by creating a visionary caliphate than redeeming the, and redeeming the people to Allah than they are by reacting against the existing cultural norms and values that are already among those peoples. Their practice is to establish a kingdom in the here and now, inviting those who accept their state as their God's true domain, and inviting all others to know the wrath of their God through their military and terrorist actions. Nothing needs to be redeemed from the existing cultures, and no one who rejects their God's purposes is of worth. They all can be tossed away wholesale so that the radicalizer's own group stands preeminent. Again, my description of radicalization and those who participate in it undoubtedly raises reminders of, those, uh, of times when self-described Christian evangelists engaged in this sort of slash and burn work. The post-colonial critique of evangelism aimed especially at some of the missionary efforts dating from the beginning of the Age of Discovery point rightly to a miserable trail of tabula rasa evangelistic logic linked to the doctrine of discovery that was used to destroy existing indigenous culture in favor of a more civilized Christian culture, or so they thought. I acknowledge this, as should all those who speak on behalf of evangelism. Terrible things have been done in the name of Christian mission. As before, though, profound failures should not be caused to toss away evangelism, but to clarify our terms. If Christians have acted as radicalizers, then let us call them radicalizers rather than evangelists or missionaries. Let us also acknowledge and repent of that, learning from it so that we can, we can evangelize today with all the winsomeness, grace, and joy that belongs to our evangel. This failure of Christians in the past brings me back around to my opening concern about the potential intervention of governments against evangelism in an attempt to halt radicalization. When the missionaries and evangelists that acted like radicalizers, both by dichotomizing the world between perceived civilized Christians and barbaric heathens, and by engaging in acts of violence to demand submission to the Christian faith, they were doing this in the name of the church and the state. I observe this point only to show that the government may not be the best guard against radicalization. Indeed, it sometimes openly supports it. ISIS is a self-proclaimed state with a government that harbors and promotes those who are the chief exhibit of radicalization in the world today. Western nations during Christendom likewise harbored and promoted radicalization. The results of that can still be traced in the pain of many indigenous peoples around the globe. The so-called multi-faith, multi-racial democracies of today might seem immune to this sort of radicalizing tendency since they're in they intentionally eschew any theological foundation in their forms of government. However, a civil theology, based not on a specific religion, but on a conglomeration of notions about promoting a strong quality of life and protecting the rights of people to self-determine, can be just as potent as any theology generated out of religious revelation. My concern today is that the Western nation state beware becoming a radicalizer as it promotes its civil theology. In doing this, it can quickly judge all those who do not adhere to this theology and lump them together as threats to the state, 
including both radicalizers and evangelists. There are two reasons that the state must be extremely careful in how it relates to religion in this day of radicalization. The first is that it teeters on the edge of becoming the very thing it wants to destroy. Given the insensitivity of policymakers to religion, this danger is real, especially given that the gospel, good as it is, nonetheless is radical in the sense of wanting to transform those who are in the world around us. This idea is teased out well in a brief exchange between Jesus, played by William Defoe, and Pontius Pilate, played by David Bowie in The Last Temptation of Christ. Pilate says to Jesus, it's one thing, you want, to ch it's one thing to want to change the way people live, but you want to change how they think, how they feel. Jesus replies, all I'm saying is that change will happen with love, not with killing. Pilate responds, either way, it's dangerous. It's against Rome. It's against the way the world is, and killing or loving, it's all the same. It doesn't, doesn't matter how you want to change things. We don't want them changed. The states and other institutions of today are no different than Rome. All are skittish about change, much less transformation. With especially the Western states girded in their secular liberal theology, as it were, the transformative work of the evangelist and the radicalizer may appear nearly indistinguishable. And in crushing both, it demonstrates it is just as willing to act as a radicalizer in its use of force to send a message against all those who would work for change. The second reason the state must be careful is that it cannot, if it cannot differentiate between the radicalizer and the evangelist in its use of force, is that it will harm itself. Whatever protection it might feel it is secured by rejecting the radicalizer who would seek to lure away or kill its citizens, it will have lost the benefits of evangelists who desire to redeem its culture, whether their message is accepted or not. To protect the true evangelist is to protect the well-being of the state. I confess that the loss of evangelists might not seem so bad in the eyes of most nations today. Certainly, I suspect that most people would readily assent to sweeping them away if it meant for a greater capacity to end the process of young people being radicalized. If this is so, it is a direct indictment on the church. It says that how we have understood and practiced evangelism has been flawed, anemic, or both. If the people around us see nothing of value in what we have to offer, perhaps it is because we have not properly esteemed the message that we were given to bear. If this is the case, the course is clear. The church must relearn its own good news and must raise up a new generation of those who are formed by that good news and who can offer it with all the redemptive good that is within it. My own sense is that we have lost the sanctified imagination within the church that evangelism requires, becoming too much like the radicalizers in reacting to the culture rather than helping the culture be defined by the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and self-control that come with the gospel. We must reclaim that imagination for what our culture can be, help others see it, and work toward it. In doing this, we should keep in focus not only the desire to redeem the people and cultures of the Western world, but of all the world, including the radicalizers themselves. After all, if the church is called to be an ambassador of the reconciliation God has offered through Jesus Christ, there is no one, including radicalizers, who are exempted from that reconciliation. Is our imagination big enough to encompass this? that evangelists would be the front line of ending the threat of radicalization by being agents of grace that God sends to bring the radicalizers to repentance and to lives of peace? To start this, my suggestion is not that the church begin with developing new programs or even less digging into study of evangelism, as much as I like doing that. Rather, I think we do better by heeding the words of Jesus in Matthew 9, 35 through 38, when he was on his own evangelistic mission. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I would contend that we are again beset with diseases and sickness of body, mind, and spirit. 
We are again harassed and helpless, both those of us who face the violence of the radicalizers and the radicalizers themselves who are plagued by deep fear and alienation. We need a good shepherd who can have compassion on us all. This job, frankly, is too big for us. It's too big even for the church, at a church as it is currently configured. Let us beseech the God of Jesus Christ, who is able to send out workers that the world needs, perhaps even supernatural workers in the forms of dreams and visions in the minds and hearts of radicalizers where no human can go to preach. In doing this, we will take our first solid steps not only to demonstrating our worth as evangelists to the state, but to helping end radicalization by helping the radicalizers find their worth too. And that would be truly radical. Thank you. Okay, well, Dr. Fowler's agreed to, to do the microphone. I guess we've got about 10 minutes, I think, for, uh, for questions, so. Thank you. Um, is this working? I don't know, Rich can tell you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you'd like to comment on the de-radicalization. Uh, for example, if you have a white racist so-called Christian radical mm -hmm. here in this country, the kind of people that the Southern Law Poverty Center tracks. Mm -hmm. Can you give instances of how they might get out of that or how they might be transformed? Right now, there are not good de-radicalizing processes out there. There's an enormous amount of work that's been going into this. Um, the, the stuff that, that frankly, it, and, and, and unfortunately, I, I think this is part of the problem, it's seated under government auspices. So um, the, the UK has recently put in an enormous amount of money uh, into de-radicalization uh, efforts. And uh, the United States, through its counterintelligence uh, agencies, are trying to do the same thing. And right now, they don't have good examples of this is how it works. My own sense of that is because they don't have a good alternative narrative for people to pick up on. Um, as, I mean, as Chesterton, I, I like the quote that he has to offer, even though they may not be able to explain things in a large way, they can explain a large number of things with the narrative of the radicals. And, and you're absolutely right, whether it's the radicalization of ISIS or whether it's the radicalization of the racist organizations in the United States or wherever it may be, we don't have good examples of it. The best that I've been able to find are examples that are more anecdotal, where people talk about how through relationship building over time, there's the capacity to break down the dichotomizing and paranoid uh, fundamentalist mindset so that folks are forced to come face to face with a real person as opposed to a stereotype of what a person or a group is. But again, that's all anecdotal. Sadly, there really isn't uh, any good example of how the governments have done this well. And if you look, I mean, the, probably the most the, uh, what is it, I'm trying to remember the name of it. There is the best example right now of what the government is trying to do around de-radicalization uh, is um, uh, a, set of, a set of YouTube videos called, uh, this is the US government, the uh, YouTube video is called uh, Welcome to ISIS Land. And they're terrible. I mean, you can pull them up on YouTube and watch them and they're miserable. I mean, they're gory, they show beheadings, they show all this thing and they say, oh, this is what you're really signing up for, in effect. But the problem is, is that it's got the big U.S. government stamp on it. So, you know, I mean, if anybody's in the least bit uh, suspicious of sources, <laughs> uh, they're going to see that and they're going to say, well, obviously, I'm not going to pay attention to this. So, unfortunately, I don't have a good example of this. I just have the anecdotal evidence of people who build relationships over time. black humanity in particular and mm -hmm. specifically, uh, who worked for years peaceably uh, and then crossed over and said that this, this scourge of slavery will not be erased from this sinful land absent the shedding of blood and war. John Brown is mm -hmm. considered a radical uh, in most of the recent literature that's been written about his life. 
and ministry. So what do we, what do we take and how do we teach mm. that radical, uh, given the construction that you've outlined? Thank you. Absolutely. No, thank you for the question. I think for me the key issue becomes, again, a question of the theology that's involved. What I can see is that while there's a theology that radicals have, they, they completely subsume it to the sociological concerns. And so they, instead of seeking a greater good for everybody by dealing with whatever immediate issues there are, there's this sense of there will be one that stands and one that's destroyed. Um, and I think that that's where I would draw the line. So the term radical, I mean, it's interesting you say this, the term radical is getting used in lots of very strange ways right now. Uh, in fact, there's a uh, few, I, I suspect nobody does, but if anybody listens to the Moody Bible Radio uh, at all, there's, uh, they've got a new um, program on called Radical uh, with this kind of sort of standard brand Southern Baptist preacher that's on there talking about it. And he wants to talk about it to try to say, oh, we need to be more than just sort of living in our ease as Christians. And he wants to push in that direction. Radical, the way that you're talking about it, it tends to be, I think, branded more from a political vantage point. What I'm trying to do is press a definition of radical that's defined more theologically. My concern is, is that there's an awful lot of people, both politically, in the political realms, the economic realms, but also in the academic world, that don't take seriously the religious aspect, the theological aspect. And so I think what you can do is you can temper the use of radical in, in John Brown's case by saying that if we look at the theological, if we look at his vision of the new world where all people are able to stand up as the children of God, right, then he's not a radical in that sense. He may be seen as a radical by the political forces, but he's not a radical in the sense of that he's stepping outside of the gospel. So that would be my way of approaching that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, some confusion. I welcome your helping me uh, to clarify here. So I was very intrigued as you began uh, your lecture with your juxtaposition of uh, the ways in which the state <clears throat> uses the language of radical radicalization uh, to uh, deauthorize, delegitimate mm -hmm. those who are deemed to be a threat or abnormal outside of the status quo with the work, the, the identity of, of the evangelist. My confusion then began as you seemed to perform the very kind of uh, dualizing of the true evangelist over and against the radical mm -hmm. that you say is problematic in the logic of the radical. This kind of Manichaean us versus them mm -hmm. Uh, one group, us versus them. <clears throat> and as you turned theologically then to the incarnation in terms of differentiating, uh, Jesus himself, word made flesh, word made radical, the one executed because deemed by the state, by religious authorities to be outside, outside the bonds of, of acceptable uh, proclamation behavior. And so I... I began to get confused in terms of uh, uh, your aims here, and I was curious why you chose to uh, demarcate so clearly between these two groups when that seems to be the problematic turn you are identifying in the radicals. So just as you uh, differentiated, nuanced, true evangelist versus perhaps untrue evangelist, I'm curious, would it not be possible to identify different forms of radicalization, certain forms which we might, might want to encourage and others uh, discourage. So in, that's a rambling mm -hmm. statement, but, but help me clarify your decision to, uh, to use these two, two terms to uh, demarcate so clearly. Part of it's a heuristic move um, so that there's clarity around it because I don't think there is clarity around the, the theological piece being brought into this. Most of what I read, uh, in, I, a lot of what I read in preparation for this were articles from you know, security, um, military, State Department kind of briefing documents. 
and so there's no clarity at all around the theological in that. And so part of what I want to do is, is lay out that there is a clarity here of what theological teachings are at stake. Uh, and for me, I mean, this is perhaps partly what you're getting, is that I want to work very hard to say that evangelism, at the heart of it, is a redemptive enterprise. It's not an enterprise that is meant to be judgmental. And so I want to make sure that that's clear, because I think that if you move outside of that, if you, if you, if you don't draw a line there around the theology, then you create a situation where evangelism itself becomes uh, polluted and where the, there's not clarity on the very off chance that somebody from Washington, D.C. actually watches this thing someday, um, you know, that, that there's clarity enough to be able to say, okay, these are the differentiations in how they're thinking and how they're making sense of, of what they're doing. So part of it is that. What I wanted to do at the end, though, is to, uh, is to avoid the move. What, so I want to draw a line, a very clear line, that's, that's differentiating in the theologies. What I want to avoid is drawing the line of saying whether the people are valuable or not. Um, and that's why I concluded the way that I did, because at the end of the day, uh, the idea is to, to offer reconciliation to everyone, including the radicalizers. And so this isn't a question of, are people valuable or not? And this is where I think that there's a difference in how the government approaches it to where, the way I'm trying to do it. I think the government has a tendency, a rather ham-fisted way of saying, there are certain people that are more valuable than others. And they differentiate along those lines rather than along the lines of, okay, what they're believing or what they're doing may or may not be helpful, uh, which is why it's so easy to crucify the people that we find radical, because we've branded the whole person as a stereotype and we can just kill them. Absolutely, and that's why I make the point that there's no, there should be no inside-outside group for the Christian evangelist. For the evangelist, the offer is for redemption for everybody. There's no distinguishing difference there. Um, and so I, I'm in agreement with you on this. I mean, I, I want to make sure that it's clear that if, if the government's trying to sort of differentiate this on a theological level, one of the key demarcations is, does somebody value all people? Does somebody want redemption for all people? That's what evangelism looks like. Does somebody not? That person can claim to be an evangelist, but they're a radicalizer. And, and I think the church needs to call that out as such. And that's what the post-colonial critique of all of the, the missionary work and that sort of thing, I think, is helpful in doing. It's saying that, this is what was going on back then. And so let's not, I mean, one of the things I deal with, and a part of what you're getting is my baggage as, a, as an evangelism guy, right? Because I, I have all these students and just people on airplanes or whoever who rarely will talk to me because evangelism is in my title. But um, when I talk to them, there's this notion of, look at all the terrible things that evangelism has done over the years. And I want to pull my hair out and say, but that's not evangelism. Yes, they put on the hat of an evangelist. They self-proclaim, but just because you self-proclaim yourself something doesn't mean that you really are. And that's what I want to try to make sure that I root that out and say, no, let's define evangelism for what it is. And it's a call for redemption for everybody in this case. Well, I know there's a, there's a lot of different ways. And I'm... There, exactly. And there are ways to, to use the language, I think, effectively, but I'm trying to, in this case, given how it's been used in the, uh, the news media and how it's being reacted against by states, I wanted to make a clear differentiation in it. Good. I think we had one more, and then we're at time. Okay. Charlie, did you have your hand up? Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really very, very interesting. Uh, I wanted to note uh, that the word radical is also related to the word revolution, which is a word you didn't use. And they're interesting in the, s in the respect that radical uh, etymologically refers to root, going to the mm -hmm. foundation, the mm -hmm. essence, the beginning of something. Mm -hmm. And revolution has the same uh, 
etymological history. That is, it starts out a revolution as you start at point A, you move around, you come back to point A. But in the modern sense, revolution means you move on to something different. And, and so the, the two terms are very interesting in how they have uh, changed under modern conditions. Now, uh, in, in American history, uh, we have a founding myth of our own revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to think about it as a war that we fought uh, in, in the late 18th century to throw off the uh, yoke of the British because they were taxing us a little too much, probably fairly, uh, and because our, uh, the honor of male elites in the U.S. Uh, was piqued by uh, the way the British treated them. And then this, this myth of revolution uh, means that uh, our, our founding, our, our sense of ourselves has mm -hmm. built into it a myth of violence, right? A myth of revolution. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that all these conversations take place in an environment where the American myth has at its essence an act of violence uh, uh, which is um, seen as our, our moment of creation and we celebrate it every year with great hoopla. And you can see how the, the, uh, all of us are implicated in, in different ways mm -hmm. from militia groups who claim it in one way mm -hmm. to a sense of southern honor, uh, the, the honor mm -hmm. element is present. Uh, and to anybody, I suppose, who celebrates for the 4th of July seriously. This isn't really a question, but I think it's related to what Dr. Kauser said and what Dr. Eberhardt said uh, in terms of how the, uh, the, um, the, the problem, what you point out as the problem, problem of radical, radicalization, mm -hmm. is a continuum in which we're all implicated, especially here in this country. Oh, I think that's fair, and that's especially why I think that the government is not the best um, organization to, uh, to differentiate on these issues. So thank you. Thank you for the questions and the comments. And thank you to Mark Teasdale for this presentation.